The following interview was conducted with um, Ron Fruitt, the Vice President for Housing and Food Service Emeritus for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, January 8, 2008, Stuart B. 26. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome. Thank Tell you. us a little bit where you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Well, I was born in uh, Wabash, Indiana in uh, 1937 on my mother's birthday. I have uh, six sisters and three brothers. I was number six of the group, and we were raised on a small dairy farm. Um, I can remember when six of us go to the barn to milk the cows by hand, about 35 head as a matter of fact. Uh, graduated from a little school called Sydney, in, which is north of North Manchester. Uh, Twelve in my graduating class. Uh, uh, came to Purdue. Uh, what about with, high school? Oh, high yeah, school, yeah. Uh, played right basketball. Here. There was only 64 in high school. Played in the band and sang in the choir. And, and six of us would go around churches singing in a sextet. Um, the family. The what family, uh, all of us. Uh, well, I have, there's only two of us who have college degrees. And two of my brothers uh, quit high school. One of them went in the service. Um, my mom was a school teacher. My dad quit school when he was in seventh grade because his father died and um, so he was a farmer all his, all his life. Both my mom and dad lived to be 90 and uh, all my brothers and sisters are still alive. The oldest is 82 and the youngest is 62. 20 years she had 10, 10 babies. Um, my mom was a superwoman. She uh, handled everything. Um, so that's that's kind of the, the sure. background there. I was very active in, in school. In high school? In high school, okay. very active. What, how, how did you happen to come to Purdue and tell us about being your days at Purdue and I uh, life? and another gentleman were tutored by our principal in trigonometry and solid geometry and so we both decided we wanted to come to Purdue and be in engineering. I was enrolled in engineering. I was salutatorian of the class and he was valedictorian. And there's only four of us, so like I mentioned, have uh, degrees. Um, so I was in uh, engineering one semester, and he uh, also traded out, and we both went to the School of Agriculture and got our degrees then from Purdue okay. in Agriculture. Now, what but year did you come to Purdue? Came in 1955, okay. that's the, and graduated in 1959. And, Tell uh, us a little bit about campus life and living on campus okay. and the activities, yeah. I lived in Kerry Hall, uh, all four years. The day I checked in, they put a waiter coat on me, and I wore that waiter coat for four years to include the Sunday I graduated. I still had to work that day because I was the head waiter. So uh, uh, I was involved in, uh, I won the Mulban speaking contest. Back then they had speech contest. I won the Alpha Zeta speech contest. Uh, I was president of my unit. Uh, got to be uh, selected to be in the Reamer Club, which is kind of an honor back then to be uh, take care of the university's mascot. Um, but I worked sometimes uh, as much as 30, 35 hours a week in the food service. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's that's uh, was the activity. Get up early in the morning and. What was the camp? How large was the camp? Was the enrollment? What was yeah, it? about twelve thousand and fifty-five, okay. as I recall. More male, more not as oh, many females. Yes, more males. Uh, still veterans at that time. Oh, okay. Several veterans and uh, from, from the Korean the, War, probably from the too. Korean War, and uh, they were curve raisers. <laughs> Made it tough on those of us who uh, weren't as mature or experienced as they were, but we made it, and uh, that was important. Right. And then uh, after graduation, uh, what, what did you major in there? I okay. ended up getting a bachelor's degree in agricultural economics. Okay. And then I had a military obligation. Were you in ROTC? No. Oh. We, we all had to take ROTC oh, our okay. first two years back then. Okay. So the freshman, sophomore year, I was in ROTC. But I had a military obligation uh, because I joined the reserves. And uh, <clears throat> so. I used to tell this to students, graduated on June 7th, got married on July 14th, went in service July 12th, and got my wife pregnant on New Year's Eve after I got out of the service. <laughs> good sequence. Yeah, good sequence of events. <laughs> the chronological. <laughs> yeah. So uh, 
Where'd you meet your wife? Where, where well, we went to high school together. Okay. She went to uh, beauty school and uh, had her own beauty salon in North Manchester. As I tell folks, I held her off for four years till I got my degree, and then we got married. And uh, still together. As all my brothers and sisters are married, and no divorces, and still all with their spouses. Good. So, where uh, where did you serve them when you uh, after you got out when the service? Where were you? Where were you I was in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. Okay. And then I had five and a half years uh, in reserves after that mm -hmm. as a non-commissioned officer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> That's what it brings us to. What was the career path before you came to Purdue? What did, after you got. Service commitment taken care of. Yeah, I went to work for Sears Roebuck in Fort Wayne as a management trainee. Uh, I found that that was not probably going to be my career. Uh, we had a store manager that, uh, uh, what shall I say, um, not always very truthful. So I decided I'd come back to Purdue and get my teacher certificate. So, being active when I was a student, the hall manager at Cary Hall said, why don't you consider being a, a residence hall assistant manager? So, uh, I, my wife and I, with our first child, moved into married student housing and, and started as an assistant manager at Cary Hall. Did you finish your, your degree? To and get then the I took, uh, I took uh, 18 hours to get a teacher certificate and then 31 hours to get a master's degree while I was working full time. Uh, my manager and the vice, well, the director of housing at that time was very, very kind to me. I was able to do practice teaching while I was working full time. I gave up all my vacation and worked at night and so I could not cheat on the hours. Um, so I finished uh, both the teacher certificate and the master's in 1967. Okay. Now you started out then as assistant manager for residence halls, and then you were the manager in Wiley, is that right? Yes. Tell us a little bit about what, because that's changed over time. Well, I was assistant manager for three years in Cary, and then I was assistant manager at Terry Courts for two, and then I became the manager in 1966 at uh, Wiley Hall, H3 okay. it was called back then, Wiley Hall. Um, during the 60s, it was kind of a trying time. Uh, we spent lots of hours with students talking about the world affairs with Vietnam and, and politics and the, the murdering of our president and the Kennedys and so forth. And anyway, we spent a lot of hours just chatting. And of course we had panty raids back then and so we'd be out at night uh, identifying students who were trying to climb the walls to get to get into the residence, the women's residence halls. Uh, so uh, being a hall manager was probably uh, the most satisfying job I had. They were all fine, no problem. Right. But then you had your own staff, you had your own students, you had uh, your own counseling staff, and and I thought I was pretty good at it. Did they have the RAs, the floor, is it similar? Yes, they were, we call them residence hall counselors back okay. then. They call them RAs now, right? And uh, uh, I always had a good staff to include some veterans. Mm -hmm. um, so, being an ex-head waiter and having a uh, bachelor's degree in ag econ and a master's in student personnel seemed to be a good combination uh, to be involved in student in affairs right. and residence halls. Yeah, and they had um, there were clubs in there too, didn't they? And oh, you sure. worked with the students on that. That was the. Uh, I should say the glue was the, having the clubs in each of the halls and everybody belonged, paid dues and lots of social activities, athletic programs, uh, cultural programs, faculty fellows started then in, in about 1968 uh, and the faculty fellow program continues. Hovde started that program. That's uh, correct, right. that's correct, For, uh, President Hovde. And he appointed uh, deans and vice presidents to be senior fact fellows. Oh, that's how it came. How you got involved? That's right. And okay. then they, we, uh, jointly with uh, the senior fact fellow, kind of identified faculty and staff to be on the faculty fellow program. Sure. And I happened to have Earl Butts, who uh, was my faculty fellow the, the first few years. But then those folks started to wane off, and they would rotate uh, with other people to be. 
faculty fellows. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were faculty fellows in all of the residence halls? Yes. Yeah, you might, for the researchers, I'm, you might just make a comment on what the faculty fellow program so that they know a little bit about it since it's been so ongoing for so long. Well, it was an attempt to uh, put uh, students and faculty and staff uh, together outside the classroom right. uh, to interact and just take the, have the benefit of being with uh, some experienced adult people. Right, and they had activities that uh, they were involved in, encouraged to participate. Sure, in many today. many fac fellows would invite if they were assigned to a floor would invite uh, those students to their home. Uh, they would come over for lunch or dinner, be invited to the awards banquets and to the dinner dances and those kinds of things. Yeah, yeah. it was very good. Yes, then, yes. Then they were then you were in uh, residence in seventy one to eighty one involved in student programs and counseling and that. What Correct. would what did that entail? Primarily uh, three things. Uh, coordinated the selection of the, back then, about 280 residence hall counselors. For all the residence halls? For all halls? the residence halls. I coordinated that effort, the interviews. And I did lots of interviewing from those who were coming in from off campus. Uh, the other thing was to coordinate the student programs called the residence hall council. And I was kind of their advisor. And the third thing was I was the the person that helped with taking care of any disciplinary cases that needed to be handled. Mm -hmm. And so those were quite was time consuming. It, right, I bet. Were there a lot of people, that, the students that applied for this, for the program? Oh, many times there, there would be uh, 300 people applied to be wow. residence hall counselors. They all needed to be 21 years old. We had several graduate students who wanted to be counselors. They got their board and room free and right. they had their tuition waived, their fees were waived. Right. Uh, and so in the, Big good Ten, in the Big Ten, the benefits were uh, better than anywhere else in the Big Ten. Right, yeah. Then this brings us to the Vice President for Housing and Food Services in 83. Yeah, in 1980 I was director of the residence halls, just the residence halls, for two years. And then um, my predecessor Jack Smalley in 1975 was promoted to be Vice President for Housing and Food Services. So in 1983, I was promoted in April of 1983. Uh, Steve Bering and I came in at the same time. Uh, I was promoted to vice president. Uh, that included all the residence halls, all the married student housing, all the, uh, the graduate houses, the Purdue Memorial Union and, and the hotel, and all the theaters, to include uh, the outdoor theaters and Elliott Hall of Music and, and also the Black Cultural Center. So those were the areas of responsibility. Uh, when I retired, uh, had 900 full-time employees. Uh, we take a snapshot of our staffing, part-time students in October, and we typically have 2,000 on the payroll for housekeeping and for food service and clerical. And um, so sizable numbers of people. Mm -hmm. I counted one time uh, when we were really packed full with students that we had about 14,000 beds wow. to include the, the uh, graduate house and the uh, hotel. Uh, There's quite, uh, quite a number fewer than that now because of how we've uh, reconfigured. Sure, right. Um, now you handled the housing and the food as well. Uh, housing and food service, right. Okay. They were all... You might want to elaborate a little bit on that, to, for the sure. housing and then the food so they well, get the... Well, the hall manager has responsibility for the total operation of the hall to include the food service, the residence hall counseling staff, and the administration of the, of the facility. Um, that's been altered some over time as well, but that's that's the way it was. The, the crux of it. The food service, uh, we have uh, a food store who does the purchasing of the food. When I retired, uh, the grocery bill was about two million dollars. The total budget for all of housing and food service was 65 million. Uh, had the next to the largest budget on campus. Uh, had the largest square footage on campus. Uh, with all those square foot, uh, square feet within the halls and so forth. So, uh, uh, fairly large operation. Um, had to interact a lot with physical facilities, with uh, the vice president for student services, uh, and uh, academic advisors. Uh, we 
try to do programs with academic advisors as well. That's quite a, quite a big thing. Yes. Uh, let, let's talk a little about the residence halls. The mission is just to provide it. And the thing about the residence halls, it's not, Purdue is unique, it's not required that they have to live in a... That's correct. Okay. We didn't require any freshmen to live in, in university housing, um, which was unique. Most of the other Big Ten schools uh, still did require um, freshmen to live in, in university housing. Um, See, where was I thinking? Ask the question again. Um, well, the, the re uh, there was plentiful housing, but the, the mission of the residence. Yeah. Also, well, the yeah. mission, of course, is to sure. provide comfortable accommodations, right? To uh, provide opportunities for students to uh, be socialized, uh, to also gain leadership skills, uh, which there was lots of opportunities for that, and of course, uh, to hopefully they'll gain lifetime friends. Right. And that, that, that does happen. Right, exactly. That does happen. Now in 83, the housing was plenty. There wasn't any crunch, but it varies, doesn't it, sometimes? You've had some crunches. Oh, and well, I, do you yes. Anticipate, can you foresee that coming down? Or? Well, yes. Uh, okay. If we work closely with admissions, uh, right. you know, when we have 7,300 freshmen coming in uh, because we allow continuing students to apply before we assign the freshmen. And so those continuing students sometimes will occupy a lot of space. And so you not always have enough for the incoming freshmen, but you need to create space for them. So we've built suites on the ends of corridors and we've had people living in uh, hotels uh, around the community. Uh, we even had them in uh, some years back in the attics of Cary Hall and over at the Armory. All kinds of places. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing that, uh, and of course, you, is the, the dorm rates. That that's always a pro, uh, well, that's, challenge. Well, that's that's right. That right? is a challenge. Uh, I recall when I lived in Cary Hall, it was six hundred and forty dollars a year for board and room. And that was twenty meals, and now they have choices of how many meals they can take or wish to pay for. Of course, my fees and my fees at the university was only eighty dollars a semester back then but I only made sixty cents an hour working now they make over six or seven dollars an hour right. so we can demonstrate that uh, if you if you strip out inflation that the rates uh, are aren't much different than they were back 20 30 40 years ago right okay yeah, yeah. but it, that is a challenge and right. uh, budgets are uh, an annual event we had a tendency to work the budgets from the bottom up. We would figure out uh, what we need for rehab, rehabilitation and replacement of equipment and furnishings, uh, what was going to do for salary and wages, and what we were going to do for f cost of food. Uh, and then uh, after all that's calculated, supplies and expenses, uh, we would set our rates. And sometimes they'd go up 3% or they'd go up 5% or 2%. And we've had some years, no increases. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and it has to be, as again, self-staining because there's no state funds. Yeah, no state funding, it's self-supporting. We even uh, pay for utilities to the university and for uh, the police department and fire department. And so we're kind of a city within a city. Mm -hmm. How about the rehab? Does that come out of, uh, does that have to come out of your operating it costs? Out, that's right, it did come out of uh, the budget. So we typically would spend uh, two or three million dollars a year just to, put on new roofs or to buy new dish machines or new equipment and so forth. Yeah. Now there was a master plan and that's uh, started earlier but now with all the, the residence halls and the housing thing has changed a lot. Yes it has right. but we did we did have uh, what you call a, a master plan to, sure. so that we could uh, project our needs for rehabilitation and replacement of equipment. Right. Such as in 93, 94 Fowler courts, and then you have to decide where are you going to put these people. Sure. Well, normally, it would have we, been there. Uh, the last hall we built was Hillenbrand, right. and at that time uh, we eliminated Fowler and Terry courts. Uh, but then we also took over some married student housing. All of the Ross Aides up next to the stadium became single undergraduate housing. So there, w there was some loss in eliminating Terry and Fowler courts in capacity but not quite as much because we took over those married student housing mm -hmm. units. Okay. And also, 
we had those two graduate houses were always full of graduate students. We put quite a few undergraduates in the graduate houses. Were those built during your time? Were they? Yes, they were. They okay. were built. Uh, was before that there was not any housing for grad students, or uh, or not a specific let building? Me think. Or I think. Have... No, there were. Oh. Um, State Street Courts, which is still there, was graduate housing. Where is State Street Courts? Well, that's down by uh, Freehaver. Between, uh, down by, some of those have been eliminated because the vet school grew, okay. but many of those have been eliminated okay. also. But there's still some there. Okay, okay. And that's, those were graduate uh, spaces. Okay. Before Young and Hawkins became. All right, interesting. Uh, I didn't so we, we, we had to move, maneuver around to accommodate. That's a challenge. That was a challenge. Yeah, yeah, right, exactly. Now all of Young Graduate House is office space, and we don't have any residents in Young Graduate House. Right. And then there's a contact with the with the community because um, over time, since you and I have been there, all of these apartments, so they've really built on. There weren't as many oh, no. when I came in, even before that, I understand, from people no. I've interviewed. We never did house all of the students. <clears throat> I think at our peak we were close to 13,000 students. Uh, <clears throat> but now, with all the apartments in the community and enrollment being up to 39,000 plus. Uh, sure. The 60s is when we really expanded. That's when we opened 58, 59 through the 60s. We opened all the H halls, which is uh, Owen, Tarkington, Wiley, and then the four high rise H halls. Were all built during happened that time? In the, in the 60s, that's okay. right. That's quite a. 58 through 64, 5, somewhere in there. That's quite a growth pattern. Oh, it was right. very fast yeah. growth, yeah. Um, what's your liaison with the Board of Trustees? You tell us about you had some liaison with them. And yes, uh, as a vice president, you're an okay. officer of the university, and so you do uh, interact with the Board of Trustees, attend all their meetings. We all, I also attended uh, the president's uh, council meetings uh, with other vice presidents. And um, uh, my interaction with uh, the board, when we'd want to request uh, a budget, or request special projects, like building another residence sure, hall, right. the board was included. And, and also the rates, the structure you the have. The rates were always uh, approved by the board. Right. That's right. Yeah. One thing I mentioned, that the FAC Fellow Program, we talked about that earlier, but with the residence hall dining facilities changing over time, um, is it, there some impact on the program? Oh, it has impacted several things. Uh, the sense of community has been disrupted because students now don't, for three times a day, collect all in one place right. to be served their meals. They can go, right. and eventually they'll go to five different locations. When the new ones open at Wiley Hall, then there'll be five locations. We've gone from 12 down to five. So it's disrupted uh, uh, the sense of community. It's affected uh, the impact that you can have on uh, belonging to a club. Uh, that is that has been impacted negatively, I think. And so the whole uh, sense of community and the whole socialization process is is different. Now, I'm, I can't assess whether it's good or bad, but it's different. Right. But it has to be different because there aren't the the food and the residence hall is not the same and that's where you usually got together once sure. a week or whatever. To include the faculty fellows. Right, so exactly. It, uh, it's, a, it's a different sure. uh, ball game with uh, that relationship. Right, I understand that. Yeah. Um, Smalley Center, you were sort of involved, that was the first building named after a, I thought that's, tell us a little bit about that, I thought that was kind of nice in 85. Well, maybe. Jack Smalley was uh, a pioneer in, uh, in the housing field on university campuses. As a matter of fact, he was one of the first to start our National Association, uh, Association of College Housing University Housing. And uh, most of the growth happened during his period. Uh, he oversaw the, all, the, all the new residence halls and the graduate houses and some additional married student housing. Most of the married student housing was either in the 40s in Ross Aid or in the 50s uh, on, off of State Street. There was one, one or two locations for married student housing was done in 1968, 
But those were the, those are the most recent ones, and the last ones we built. So uh, he was a pioneer, uh, and did a great job. And so and he was local. He, and he was local. He grew up locally. He was a military guy, Purdue grad, uh, and. Uh, uh, so when he retired in 1983, uh, we solicited the board to name the building Smalley Center. Yeah, that's very. That's a nice yeah. thing. Now, yeah. one of one of the facilities that you were in, um, over was the Black Cultural Center, and you were involved with the facility committee with that with the, for well, the new place. Tell us a little bit about well, that. Well, uh, when the Black Cultural Center was uh, established. Uh, the university decided they wanted to make it a uh, administrative operation because it needed money to operate. And so Housing and Food Services was the logical place to put it at the time. Uh, and we started in a two-story house. Right, I remember that. And then we, uh, when, what, the year, two years before I retired, they built the new facility. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we felt, and the university felt, that we could probably give them uh, as much support as anybody else on campus. Mm -hmm. And I know that's been changed and moved away from housing and food services and now is part of the Vice President of Student Services. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I understand that, right. Yeah. And we t uh, now you served under, uh, doc you and Dr. Barron came the same time as you said. 1983. Right? So you interacted quite a bit. I we mean, did. Yeah. Uh, he was, uh, he was very supportive of our our uh, division. Uh, when he would get uh, complaints or when he would get inquiries from parents or from people that that if was involved with our division, he would send those down to us and we would take care of it and let him know what we did. Yeah, that's very nice. Yeah. That worked out very nicely. Uh, Tell us a little about some of your involvement with some of the with your college university housing, some of the association that the association sure. been involved I was in. On several committees, okay. program committee and, and evaluation committees and that kind of thing. Uh, that afforded uh, many of our staff to visit lots of other campuses, uh, all the way from Boston to LA to Seattle down to Miami and in between. Uh, and so it was really a very uh, uh, professionalized uh, uh, opportunity. Right. As one of the people said, it was professionalizing the profession. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't say it better then. Okay. Now you were an honorary old master and shortly after you became the, the vice president. That's in 83. Yes, I yeah, was. Uh, that's very nice. Good way honor to work into it. Yeah, well, I, I had some students uh, who were heavily involved in honorary <laughs> old masters and they used to come in and tell me all the good times they had with the old masters. <laughs> So they made me an honorary old master. Yeah. And I was advisor to many organizations. Tell us which ones were you some well, of Well, I was an advisor to the Reamer Club, being an alum of the Reamer Club. I was advisor to Tomahawks. I was advisor to uh, APO. Uh, then I was also advisor to the Residence Hall Council, of course, when sure. I was uh, student, student programs and counseling. Yeah. Um, there's probably some others there I'm overlooking. Uh, you talked about the Reamer. Did you go? Did you go to any wave games with the with the Boilermaker special when you were here? Oh yes, my room. My roommate. Can you recount a, any particular ones? That yes, I can recount uh, the uh, the second Purdue Pete was my roommate. So we used to go to the way games. I remember being in Wisconsin one time, and uh, we did we didn't we had an old Boilermaker special then. When I was in the Reamer Club, we sold salty dog records, trying to raise enough money to get a new uh, Boilermaker <laughs> special. Well, it turned out Buick Division bailed us out, thanks to Don. The Mallet. original one was made by Studebaker. That's correct. And the next one was General Motors. That's right. And uh, uh, Vice President Don Mallet and uh, a few Reamers made that happen. But anyway, we went to Wisconsin one time, and my roommate was Purdue Pete and Bucky Badger. The game was a bore. So they got in a little tussle on the end zone, and that was the most excitement of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Can't believe that. Yeah. But it does add a little touch oh, when sure. things are going down, right? That's right. <laughs> um, <laughs> I had a hard time uh, making all the uh, 
the meetings with the Reamer Club because I was working in food service. Sure, right. And right. at noon, as you know, at the Lions, why the Reamers would meet and give the Central Standard Time and give right. it a few cheers and right. sing the songs. Got gotcha, you right. <laughs> uh, do you part? Have you participated in the Alumni Association, being an alum, Purdue alum? Yes. Okay. Uh, when I retired okay. in 1996, I uh, volunteered to uh, help the Alumni Club meeting with alumni uh, alumni clubs throughout the country. So I did that five years and, and went to their uh, meetings three times a year, uh, the National Association meetings sure. here, and so I was in, involved uh, that way. Yeah. How about uh, your retirement? You, did you take early retirement? I did. I, uh, Tell us about what your I activities had a, have been. I had a financial goal. I reached it at 59 and a half, and so uh, 59 and a half I retired. And then when I worked five years uh, part-time with the Alumni Association, I ran for a political office. I was a county councilman for eight years. I was on uh, Westminster board for 12 years. I was on a, a board of cooperative extension for six years. I've been on a convention visitor bureau board, an emergency management board, and so uh, several things. Very active. When I turned 70, I said, that's enough. Let somebody else do it. I was also uh, chairman of the Republican Party for two years, and that was like pushing a rope, but it was okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think this is a good quote. Students are what working life is all about, guiding, advising, and teaching them how to be adults. I think right. that's very well said. Well said. Share any favorite memories of, of your times in the residence halls and um, comes to mind? Having Earl Butts around was, uh, being an Ag Econ graduate, uh, right. we got well acquainted and of course he was Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, Don Parlberg was another person that was uh, a kind of a mentor. My hall manager probably was uh, Bob Hunt and Kerry Hall was probably uh, a more like a second father to me than anybody on campus. And he's the one that talked me into coming back and joining the residence hall staff. Sure. Uh, events, uh, oh, I've got lots of stories I could tell about events, all the way from students faking and hanging in the room for the floor maid to get all excited about. <laughs> to, Creativity, one to, on one, right? To, yeah. To uh, when we had dinner dances, uh, we'd have uh, uh, etiquette tables for students to learn how to uh, um, use their etiquette uh, at the table with their girlfriends and wear tuxes. I still have a tux today that in 1964 we had uh, Sinos out of Chicago bring their used tuxes down for the students to buy because I had to wear it formals to go to the dinner dances. I bought one for $35 and still have it today and can still wear it. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> That's excellent. <laughs> oh, do you have a uh, favorite Purdue tradition that um, you'd like to share with us? Favorite Purdue tradition, there's, there's many. Right. Okay. Of course, I think the Boilermaker Special is, sure. is uh, very special. There can be more than uh, one. There That's aren't, great. There aren't, there aren't many uh, schools that have that kind of a mascot. Um, I'm heavily involved with Purdue Athletics and have been as a fan ever since I was a freshman in 1955, both football and basketball. Yes, I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, I've been yeah. a fan all those years. I had a member of the John Purdue Club since I don't know, 1970 maybe, somewhere in there. Um, uh, traditions that uh, that I think about, uh, the Tomahawks uh, are, a, are a special group, and, and so are the APO. Large numbers of uh, students belong to APO because it's kind of an extension of Boy Scouts and Girl mm -hmm, Scouts, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. All right. Good group. Uh, might you know, tell the re uh, researchers who APO was an, as an honorary, is that correct? That's right, it okay. was an honorary. Okay. When I was an uh, advisor to Tomahawk, uh, I was the national advisor f uh, for a couple years, and there were clubs at IU, at Illinois, at Monmouth College, at Iowa State, and Northern Iowa, and at Purdue. That's it. And so we would 
uh, they would have annual meetings, uh, and so we'd travel to those schools, and that was that made it nice. That was very nice. Right. Very yeah, nice. Right. Um, family. Uh, have uh, my high school sweethearts, my wife, and we'll be celebrating 50 years in in 2009. I have four children, uh, three boys and a daughter. Do they live close by? or I have one living uh, between Cincinnati and Dayton, Ohio, and the other three are here in the Lafayette area. Okay. And they all have some kind of a degree, advanced degree, so that was important. They all went to, to Purdue, us. huh? Didn't go to Purdue. Ball State and Vincennes and... That's okay. <laughs> Dad was here. <laughs> oh, Didn't dear. want to be too close to Dad, <laughs> I guess. Uh, how about an outstanding event, if I ask you that? You got one that you'd like to share um, with us? Going, uh, being selected to be a host for the uh, 1967 Rose Bowl in California. I remember the salty dogs were on our plane. We went on a prop plane because it was a long, long flight. I remember playing cards with the salty dogs. But I remember the, I remember that uh, that trip as being a highlight. Uh, I remember going to. Uh, the Purdue uh, NCAA championship game in 1980 in Indianapolis, and that was uh, exciting. Went to all the games up to the finals. Um, in the residence halls, uh, the, the traditional dinner dances we had were, were special. We, we worked real hard to make that right. a significant emotional event for the students. Uh, all the way from how it was decorated to how everybody looked and how good the food was and the and the good band uh, we had in the ballrooms and that it was a big it was very a big, right. big time event right yeah um, and any questions that you'd like to ask or make some closing remarks or anything that you'd like to share with us well I've been a diehard Purdue fan uh, both as a student and as a staff member and and uh, I've said many times I can't imagine having a a better career than what I had. It, it's not something that people think, golly, I want to be a director of university residences. That's not how it works, because <laughs> I don't know of anybody who said, that's what I'm going to be when I grow up. <laughs> uh, you grow into it, I You think. grow into it. Right. And a lot of it has to do with uh, what you are or when. Yeah. How about Chauncey Village? How has that changed in the time since you've been here? Chauncey Village? Right. Yeah, you were talking about uh, the village down the here. Village. Right. right. Well, there was a I time. I usually ask people because they're interested in what, you know, how it's changed in versus to, as oh, well as well. university. Yeah, uh, the surrounding community has sure. changed a great deal with all oh, the yeah. apartments, but also the village. That used to be just kind of a bare lot down there. Uh, but since we don't have our own bookstore on the campus, uh, those kinds of facilities naturally sure. uh, kind of grow up. Yeah. Uh, and since many students live off campus, and as we've grown to 39,000 students, uh, those, uh, those kinds of places sure. had to be there to provide. Right, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Any other closing moments that you want to say? No, I uh, um, had a happy career. That's right. I thank you very much. This concludes the interview. Thank you, Ron. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh -huh. <laughs>